Hi, thank you for coming uh, for sitting through this selfish accessibility talk. I'm just going to dive right in. I'm watching the counter over there, which is only giving me a little bit of mild panic. Uh, it is my experience that when people stand up and tell you stuff and expect you to listen to them, you want to make sure that they aren't just making up crap. <laughs> don't, don't you have to take a wee? Incidentally, that top row is all Bruce's fault. So I've written some stuff. I'm online. Uh, I suggest you go block me on Twitter probably now. Uh, so I do things. I'm involved with the W3C and standards process. I run some stuff. There's a free online 24-hour accessibility conference coming up in October. So there's plenty there on which you can judge me. So get on that. I'm uh, going to start off with a bit of a primer here. Um, if you are on Twitter very often, you might see the A11Y hashtag come through, or A11Y, or some people pronounce it Alley. Jerks. <laughs> A11Y is what we call a numeronym, and all we're doing is we're shortening the word accessibility. People in the industry don't have like typing it every time. A lot of us will mistype it. So A11Y, just like internationalization or localization, it's the first letter, the last letter, and then the number of letters that you replaced. So if you are interested in seeing some of the conversations around accessibility, you could just pound A11Y on Twitter. Today, again, as Bruce mentioned, being Global Accessibility Awareness Day, I assure you there's a ton of material out there. Um, a ton of material. Actually, maybe avoid it today. Uh, I wanted to start off with this quote from the World Health Organization. This is their current definition of disability. Disability is not just a health problem, it is a complex phenomenon reflecting the interaction between features of a person's body and features of the society in which he or she lives. As software developers, I think we have some experience with the concept of feature mismatch. We expect a piece of software to work one way. We have uh, another piece of software that's supposed to work with it, and maybe it doesn't. I assume all of you, at one point or another, have tried to install a printer. Feature mismatch. Um, the 1980 definition, World Health Organization in 1980 had a different definition, which I'm thrilled that they got rid of. In the context of health experience, a disability is any restriction or lack of ability resulting from an impairment to perform an activity in the manner or within the range considered normal for a human being. Normal. One thing I've learned about working in accessibility is the people who consider themselves normal aren't. The people who don't consider themselves normal also aren't. They've just come to terms with it. So good for them. When, um, when my uh, previous partner's software company I ran uh, were repainting the office, they decided they were going to paint my office accessible beige. This is the color of pleated khakis or 1980s IBM computers, this terrible putty. Conceptually, accessibility just doesn't seem to get the respect throughout any industry. Uh, not that paint colors would be the one I'd choose normally, but I did. So at some point, you have to have this conversation with somebody about why you need to worry about accessibility and how many uses it's going to affect. And we always start off these conversations with our clients talking about statistics. Because we, we know that they like to see raw numbers. And we know that disability, which includes a range of uh, different number of implications for people, visual, hearing, mobility, cognitive, speech, which I don't have listed there, these are all factors that we need to consider. And we know that they also change with age meaning that if you are fit now, um, enjoy it, because that will stop, uh, sometimes startlingly so. With vision impairments, there are a lot of people worldwide. We're talking about almost 300 million people worldwide who are blind, have low vision. When we talk about hearing impairments, 360 million people worldwide have some sort of hearing impairment. Mobility impairment in the US, you can see the number jumps from 5.5% up to a third of the population as they age. Uh, with cognitive impairments, this is such a broad category that it's really difficult to quantify. So dyslexia, dyscalculia, which is the numbers version of dyslexia, memory issues, ADD, ADHD, and so many other things all fall into cognitive. It's such a broad spectrum, it's tough to cover. And that number tends to increase with age as well. 
The thing that's really the most important takeaway isn't the hard numbers, it's just to know that within your population of, of your audience for whatever product or site or service you're offering, one in five of those people has some form of impairment, some form of disability. And also consider that usually they don't come as a one, that they come in sets. You're not always going to know what those sets are. So when I make these conversations with clients, when I, when I make this argument rather, it tends to fall flat. They're not thinking too much about um, how they're going to support it. The numbers might not sway them. One in five doesn't feel realistic to them. So I have a different pitch that I use for them. And it's basically being selfish. I got into accessibility not because I have a disability, but because I saw a market opportunity. I saw a market differentiator, a way for my software company to set itself apart from the pack. It was wildly selfish of me. Um, and then I fell into the rabbit hole and now I'm all in. So yay for me. Uh, web Accessibility in Mind is a not-for-profit that focuses on uh, accessibility and providing resources and training and material and articles and tutorials. And they have this hierarchy for motivating accessibility change. Guilting people is the bottom. It's like the worst thing you can do. And, and then you punish them because they didn't put alt text on an image, make it a requirement of the job, part of a checklist. You reward them. Hey, here's a Starbucks gift card because you did your job. Um, you, they want to enlighten them and eventually inspire them. It's difficult to inspire people, I've found. What I have found with some of my clients is the star on top of this tree is to make it about me. It's okay to be selfish if you're helping other people. At least that's what I tell them. So, as part of this service, I like to walk the clients through some of these mental exercises. Uh, one of them is that we are all getting older. Unless you're really lucky, you're going to get old. Uh, it does carry risks and side effects. It definitely is not for the young. Um, if you pay attention to how few young people are old, you'll see it doesn't, it doesn't correlate. So if I look at these couples sitting on this stone wall, what is the difference between them besides about five feet? Age. That's it. They're both having a conversation about where they're going to go for lunch, what they're going to do next. They have the same goals, same things they're trying to do, same objectives, no different. They've just been arguing about lunch for potentially 30 more years than the other couple. The difference between these two women. So age is the obvious one, but closer to what you were saying, one of them is more technologically adept, and it's her. She's using the solar-powered reading device. <laughs> she doesn't have to recharge it. Look at that skeuomorphic interface. She knows exactly how many pages are left. <laughs> so if, um, like me, you are invincible, maybe allergic to nothing, um, you have to take into account that accidents happen. Things that you don't expect. You can fall off a stage. You can get closed in a train door. Broken limbs, eye injuries, hearing injuries, head trauma. I list these because all of these have happened to me. I've been in all of these circumstances at least once. Uh, the head trauma, certainly more than at least once. Imagine this is your mouse hand. Imagine this is your typing hand. It becomes more difficult. It's harder to hit a target on the screen. It's a little bit harder to type accurately. You're getting more typos. Imagine if it's both of your wrists. There are lots of people who have carpal tunnel. Carpal tunnel syndrome, where they're wearing the braces, they don't think of themselves as disabled. But in reality, they are. There's a feature mismatch between what their body is capable of doing with these attachments and what their computer might be expecting of them. Uh, similarly, poke yourself in the eye. You have to walk around with, a, with an eye patch for a week because you're not a pirate. Uh, this affects depth perception. And if you try it for a day, I challenge you to see how good your typing is at the start of day one when you start missing keys because depth perception throws you off. We also have to consider people who are assigned new assistive technology that they've never used before. If you've never been in a wheelchair before, you're not going to know which is the right one to pick out. And it can be a problem for anybody standing around you. Uh, by the way, I encountered this in uh, the park a couple days ago. What's the park that's north of here? The lovely one that's, I don't know. Buh, 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 buh. 
that sounds right. <laughs> but I saw this picture, and I saw this girl immediately climb up on it, and I saw her looking around for things to make it go forward. And I was very alarmed, and I ran, because that looks very heavy. Some people might start off the day perfectly fine with no physical impairments. Arguably, they have mental impairments. <laughs> This is the Cooper Hill cheese rolling and wake. And what they do every year, that's a wheel of cheese. They start at the top of a hill and they roll a wheel of cheese down the hill. And then everybody runs after it. And waiting at the bottom of the hill, ambulances. And they usually do four heats, four waves of people. And one year they had to delay the second wave because all five ambulances were still at the hospital. The, the point is, none of them started the day thinking that they were going to end up being broken. But things happen. Um, back to being invincible. We also have to think about situational impairments, being in a context that disables us. Uh, working in the sun, for example, multitasking, which, by the way, nobody can actually multitask, eating at your desk, not having your headphones handy, or the content is not in your native language, which translates loosely to me using um, the keyboard on my phone, which doesn't have some of the letters in your alphabet, which has meant, meant uh, translating anything here is really difficult. Uh, so this is me on an, on an average day. I eat lunch at my desk. Uh, you can tell because if I turn my keyboard up right now, enough stuff will fall out to feed me for the weekend. But you're basically uh, you're, you're eating lunch with your mouse hand, and now you're just a keyboard user for the afternoon. Um, here are two guys who are multitasking. I appreciate, I really appreciate how they've gone, gone all in on this. Uh, the tarp, the table, the computers, the phones, they're not actually doing anything on them. But this guy takes it a step further. He's really doing everything he can to block the sun from his keyboard. Also, that's a typewriter. <laughs> He's my favorite. Uh, this is a guy working in a cafe. He's just trying to edit some video. Note the video camera there. Once that espresso maker goes on in the background or the grinder goes on, he can't hear anything. He has to wear his headphones. He's not low hearing, but in the context of a cafe and all the noises in it, he is deaf for that span of time until they're done grinding beans. So he's relying on the assistive technology of the headphones in this case. Uh, for those of you who might be um, trying to do work at night, listen to training, read books, watch videos, um, play video games, illegally stream Avengers, maybe you don't want to wake up your partner. So, you know, headphones can come in handy there. I would not want to wake... He's a, he's a good doggo. I would not want to wake up that doggo. Uh, and this image roughly corresponds to me on some of my international trips where, for reasons, I have not been able to check into my flight and I've had to go to the post office or the library to use their computer, and I have discovered that not only are the keys not in the same arrangement, but some of the letters are different. So I start typing, muscle memory kicks in, and I'm looking at the screen, and it takes me 20 minutes just to type my own name into a field, just because the keyboard is laid out differently. So just having that language difference can be enough. We also have to consider our role as being tech support for our family. Every time I go to my parents' house for any holiday, I have to change the printer toner. I have to run a virus scan on their computer. I have to make sure that they haven't installed anything weird, uh, download their emails, it's a long list. The whole point is, these are the kinds of things that you shouldn't have to waste your time on if the tools, the software, the applications they were using were better catered to them. Um, again, our comfort level with technology tends to protect us. Those aren't my parents. I don't know who they are. Uh, they asked me to leave. So who else does, does all this stuff affect? It affects everybody. If you look around the room, it affects everybody. Now, I've stolen this image from Microsoft, their inclusive design toolkit. I think that's okay because I think they stole this concept from me. 
it's a natural fair trade. But they've done a good job of identifying people in different contexts and situations. Um, the bartender who can't hear anything because he's shaking next to his ear. The, um, the lady with the sword and shield. She can't operate her phone because she has to put down her sword and shield. And an iPhone will not stop a spear, I'll tell you that much. But they've gone through, oh, I also discovered that if you're carrying a baby, you're expected to hold it with both hands and not drop it. <laughs> but these are all essentially disabling situations. These are representations of people with disability, people with temporary disabilities, and people in disabling situations. Temporary and contextual. We should also consider that sometimes the things that we produce in the sense of uh, supporting people with disabilities end up being valuable for everybody. This is an easy example for me. Does everybody recognize the Aaron chair? The symbol of the 90s dot-com boom and then bust? I think, I, think, I think developers were trading in their Aaron chairs for sandwiches for about 10 years. This chair started off as a chair for elderly people who mostly could not move around very well. They found that recliners were bad for them. They'd get bed sores because they were in them for too long. There was no breathing under the, under the, the, the fake leather. They couldn't opti activate the chair easily to make it go backward and forward. It didn't have support around the sides and back. The Aaron chair is the outgrowth of building something for elderly people. And it is a symbol of new tech hotness. And I should have looked in the Wix offices if they have Aaron chairs. We'll pretend I did. So after I've sort of walked through this with clients, I like to talk to them through some uh, user experience models, some examples. Uh, a lot of my clients work with personas. They work with user stories. And there's some great resources already out there. Sarah Horton and Whitney Quesenberry wrote a book called A Web for Everyone, where they put together personas for different disabilities. These are free online. All of my slides will be available after this, so you can grab this stuff. But you can grab personas that are pre-built that have people with disabilities, and you can see the kinds of considerations that they need, the things that they're focused on, the tasks they have to consider. My experience with clients, though, is that they tend to discard anything after the first three to five personas. So if you have uh, Lisa, or Leah, rather, if you have Leah, and she's in a stack of personas, they're going to look at Leah and say, well, you know what, we don't really need to worry about somebody who has chronic pain. Discard that persona. And let's take a look at Vishnu. OK, he's got low vision. Now we need to get down to our core three to five personas. So I have a slightly different approach that I use with my clients as well. And that is a selfish persona. Um, when I can, I take a picture of a client or somebody like the client and jam them in the picture. You have a really nifty museum in town, the uh, Museum of Illusions. The room was upside down. So I got to do this cool, creepy. I thought that photo was hilarious. <laughs> that, that just fell flat. No, well, you're laughing for the wrong reasons. So what I like to do is, in these selfish personas, I like to reflect traits of the stakeholders. If they travel on a train, if they keep the office very bright or work on the golf course all the time in the sun, if they don't know how to use their smartphone, um, if they can never hear you in a meeting, they're always asking you to speak up. I pay attention to these things. I want to find ways to take traits of the stakeholders, the people who decide on this project, and fold them into my personas. So no longer do I have disabled personas, but what I have are personas that have traits that correspond to temporary situational contextual dis disabilities that they're not going to discard because they see themselves in these personas. It's sneaky but I count on their selfishness pulling me through. So uh, for example, user stories, you're probably familiar with them. Uh, the components, it's a user who talks about an outcome for value. So when you write it as user, I want outcome, so that thing. So I'm going to walk through some real quick ones here. Um, as a user on a sunlit patio, I want to be able to read the content and see the controls. This has worked well for clients of mine who work on the golf course. Jing is reading the bottom of the slide. Add beer, and as a user, I may have trouble focusing. By the way, we have a whole persona for one client that's drunk people. 
Um, as a user in bed with a sleeping spouse, I want to watch a training video in silence so that I can get caught up at work. Obviously, the gist here is you don't want to wake up your spouse. I have a thing down here. Uh, as a user who doesn't want to get punched for having slacked, slacked off at work. Usually nobody notices those jings, so you, you threw me off. Now I feel obligated. Or I'll just stop and everybody can go grab these slides later. In order to click links as a user with no elbow room in coach class or the tiny trackpad, I want click areas to be large enough and adequately spaced. So I flew here uh, goat class, because that's how I always fly. And I don't know if you're aware in goat class, but they fit like 12 in per row and they stack you. It's very difficult to reach in front of, I almost used the wrong word, reach in front of somebody and work the, the keyboard. So this is a problem. But again, we have clients who travel all the time and they understand how difficult it can be to use the computer when they are traveling on a plane, in a train, whatever that scenario is. As a user distracted by the TV, I want clear headings and labels so that I don't lose my place. We have a lot of clients who work from home. And one call I'm on every week, I swear it's Netflix streaming in the background. Or actually, I think he's partway through Game of Thrones. I'm not quite sure. So selfish user stories. Try to apply these where you can, if it works. Now, I have a whole pile of slides set up to talk about technical bits. And I'm looking at the countdown of time. I'm doing OK. Uh, did we already do lunch? Yeah, cool. Um, I'm going to run through these slides somewhat at speed. I'm not going to hit all the bullets here because I don't want to uh, hammer on stuff that you can go read later on. I have links in the slides, a bunch of reference material as well. Um, when you have images on a page, make sure there's an alternative, a text alternative, icons, pictures, font icons, whatever they are. You want to make sure that if the image goes away, that p your users can still make sense of that page. And that applies for people who are on crappy Wi-Fi connections, not just people who are blind or low vision or running some novel theme in their browser. As an example, this is a uh, inner city youth soccer program that my company started a few years ago. What I like about it is that that kid is big, happy, running around, chasing after the ball. Um, the, the shot I took immediately after this, he's actually face down on the grass, his feet up over his head. He, he tried so hard to kick that ball. But if the images disappear, you can still understand the page. That was a decorative image, so blank alt text is fine. All those other icons that go away, that's OK, too. Up in the corner, when the logo is gone, it says Buffalo Soccer Club. That's the alt text because that's important and relevant. I don't need to tell a story. I don't need to say picture of. I don't need to say logo of. Just simple, plain language there. Um, so image, alt text, make sure it's there where you can, not just pictures, SVGs, other things. Uh, but in particular, don't overstress about it. Just get it in there. Hyperlinks. Hyperlinks are sort of the, the, the core of the web. They're the reason that we have a web. So you can click a piece of text and see a hamster dancing, or whatever is the current meme. Be careful with the text that you use. Don't use all caps. Tell people if they're going to download a 500 megabyte PDF. If, if they're going through multiple steps of something, convey that information. If you're using an image as a link, make sure the alt text makes sense as well. Um, please underline your stuff where you can. Remember that your project, your site, your application is not Google. People don't necessarily know how to use it instantly as soon as they step into it. There's some training ramp up time. Underline your links. Have good contrast between the link text and the surrounding text. Make sure it's obvious. The scenario is you want users at a glance to know what can be clicked. And with so many different ways that people might code this, it's hard to tell what, what's clickable. Is it the image, the title, the abstract, the ellipsis, all of these? Can we change it on a per page basis just to screw with people? Um, which is hilarious, by the way. OK, color contrast. Make sure you have enough contrast on your page. Thin gray text on a gray background, that's not cool, man. I feel so serious about that, I want to turn this chair around and sit down on it and have a proper conversation with you about how that's not cool. That's probably on an American thing. Uh, 
WCAG provides some basic rules, and there are a ton of tools out there that will walk you through checking your contrast to make sure that you're meeting at least the minimums and where you can doing better. But if you have the opportunity, build something into your own style guides, into your pattern libraries, into your design systems, and they can show you what are the safe colors to use with one another and what ones not to use at all. I find this works really well when we have our clients identify what the contrast ratio is and also say, definitely don't use these. We will come and yell at you. Also note that in WCAG, the contrast now includes icons and glyphs and form elements more than just the text on the page. I'm going to guess that a lot of you here build forms. If you're doing that, please label your fields. Do everything you can to label your fields provide some programmatic indication of a required field, give them some formatting advice in plain text, not MMDDYY or DDYYMMM. Don't stop them because they included a hyphen in the credit card number. Just accept it and strip it out. There are a lot of ways that you can really help people out when it comes, out to, comes to filling out fields. Definitely associate error messages with fields for people who are using uh, voice technologies or who are using screen readers, they're not necessarily going to know which field is the problem. I have some reasonable technical stuff here, which I'll just skip it for now. What I do want to do is play this short video. It's, uh, it's only uh, 14 minutes. Um, <laughs> this is me trying to donate money on the Indiegogo site using a screen Go reader. Below Indiegogo busy. Clickable link skip to main content. Main menu navigation landmark link Indiegogo logo graphic Indiegogo logo. Button search button. Login visited link. Okay. Edit has autocomplete. Blank. Edit has autocomplete. Blank. Now if you close your edit eyes, has autocomplete. which field Blank. am I on next? Country edit. Blank. Oh, well that was easy. So I type okay. in country. Edit has autocomplete. I tab off the Blank. field and it goes away. Edit has autocomplete. Blank. All of these fields edit is has edit has autocomplete. Blank because that label text is not Blank. programmatically edit associated. Blank. Edit has autocomplete. The problem here Blank. is that at some level, um, Indiegogo has decided that they really don't care about getting money from users of screen readers. They didn't say that, but that's the implication. And for people who are using a screen reader, that's exactly how they feel. And it's even weirder when I find that organizations who support the disability community use Indiegogo to raise money. Uh, please, when you can, structure your document. I don't care if you're generating it on the server, in the browser, if you're writing it down on paper and emailing it, I don't care. HTML has some really nifty, simple elements. There's just a handful of them. And if you use them right, a screen reader user and some other assistive technology users can jump around the page pretty quickly. And it's not too hard to figure out what maps to what. This layout, does it look kind of familiar to you? It's probably a web page which means you can probably guess what would, be the hood, what would be the header, what would be the footer, which is the main content area. Some of these can live in each other. The nav can live inside the header, for example, at the bottom, at the side. You can have more than one. The thing is, if you're using HTML just the way it is, you're already going to be in good shape. And if this is a responsive layout, and by responsive, I mean narrow width. I'm not talking about all the other ways that things are actually supposed to be responsive. This is still pretty clear. I think it's still pretty obvious what should be what. And my guess is even before I put that text up there, you had a really good sense of it. You may have heard about the document outline algorithm, which is the thing that people have told you means you get to use an H1 repeatedly over and over on the page. Don't even worry about it from there. There never has been a document outline algorithm. It's never been a part of a spec. It doesn't help SEO. Just pretend you never heard about it. And if you never heard about it before I said it, sorry. Just be smart about your headings. Ultimately, if you can, you want your headings to look like a, a bullet list, just a nested, structured bullet list. If all you do is generate that list of headings, somebody should be able to look at it and understand what sections live under which sections. Pretty straightforward there. Uh, I mentioned before being keyboard friendly where you can. If you find that you have content that overflows and is in a scrolling area, make sure that a keyboard user can access it. And it can be as simple as adding a tab index of zero. If you do that, you don't want to confuse the screen reader users, so some additional code that you can throw in there so that it makes more sense. 
Where might that apply? So I have clients who are a big fan of having data tables that are full of content that clips because they want every row to be exactly the same size. I don't know why. They've never been able to explain this to me, but it's really important to them. So what you're seeing here is somebody navigating the, through these two tables, pressing the tab key. Until I added this code, they had to hover over each cell to see all that text. I mean, this is still stupid, but at least somebody with a keyboard can experience that stupidity on their own. Just expands in that case when it's got focus, and here you can use the arrow keys to scroll up and down in the fields. Um, similarly, don't use a div or a span as a control. If you find you're putting an on click on something that isn't a button, or an input type submit, or a link, maybe rethink that. Once you start doing that, you have to take into account a bunch of other things. Um, links do not fire when you press the spacebar. Do you know what happens if you put focus on a link and hit the spacebar? It scrolls one screen full. It doesn't announce that. If you're on a screen reader, for example, you won't know it. But if you put a roll of button on a link, now you've confused your users. Also note that um, when you, now I've gone and messed it up in my head, buttons press on key down, and links, I think, fire on key up. So you have to pay attention to the difference of which event fires at which point. And part of the reason I don't remember it off the top of my head, oh, and I removed it from my speaker notes, is because I get to use the, the right element for the job, and I don't have to worry about it. The thing is, you can style these three to look any way you want. These are three different things, a link, an input type submit, and a button, and you can't tell the difference between them because it's just a handful of CSS to make them look the same way. So the argument about not being able to style a link or a button the way you want has never held water with me because there's always somebody on the team or some code, maybe from Stack Overflow, that can help you get through this. It's pretty straightforward and easy to do in my experience. Uh, definitely define focus styles, particularly if you're removing link underlines. Everywhere you define a hover style, colon hover in your CSS, have colon focus. Easy. You're reusing the same style. You don't have to come up with anything new or special. Um, if you ever find focus outline none in libraries, just delete it. Don't tell anyone. Just quiet, delete, merge, walk away. This is Google's help page related to, um, this is the, the Google Chrome help page. This uses the default focus ring in Chrome, which is blue, and it's on their blue thing. Few people can see that unless it's projected really well and you have a, a TV screen projecting it into a crowd for those of you not wearing sunglasses. Otherwise, it's not very obvious. Don't rely on the browser defaults if you can. Come up with something better. The, the risk, of course, is that you end up with something where, um, as you're tabbing through the screen, you have no idea where you are. This page has won a lot of design awards. It's also defunct now. But this is me actively tabbing through the page, and it isn't until it scrolls that I can tell where I am on the screen. And I still don't know where I am. I just know I'm further down. Not very effective. So that's... That's all the tech stuff. Again, I'll upload those slides. I'm going to wrap this up over a few slides. There's a general message that I'm trying to get across here. Supporting accessibility now, today, is going to help to serve the future version of you. It's a totally selfish way to approach it, but that's OK. Similarly, supporting, the, supporting accessibility now is going to help that injured you, that, that encumbered version of you, that version of you that's in a disabling situation. But if you can get younger developers to get in, get in on it now, and you can teach them well, it's going to help you in the future. Maybe when you're no longer doing this thing. Maybe when you moved on to another role. You want people coming up behind you in the ranks to build stuff that that older, more broken version of you can actually use. Uh, this is what I call a stair ramp, which was recently rebranded as a stramp. This has been used in so many accessibility talks as a way to beautifully integrate accessibility. It's a ramp that, you can, that they've worked into stairs. The problem is, if anybody in a wheelchair goes onto this ramp, they're going to die. <laughs> it's too steep. It's too narrow. If they go up, the wheelchair will fall back. If they go down, they hit a wall or end up in the pit of crocodiles. 
and somebody like me who takes stairs two at a time trips as soon as I get to those things. The thing to remember is somebody built that because they were satisfying a checklist. Accessibility is not a checklist. It's something that requires ongoing maintenance, for example. Here's a ramp outside a drugstore. A friend of mine in a wheelchair visits regularly. And last winter, two winters ago, he went to the store and they shoveled everything, but they put the giant potted tree onto the wheelchair ramp. But we built a wheelchair ramp. Everything's fine. <laughs> yeah. But you you got to not fill it with crap, guys. So it's not a checklist. It's an ongoing process. It's something that, cool, you built it. When you get there and you built it, that's great, but now maintain it. Don't let it get broken. Make sure that it becomes a part of that, that culture and that process. I have a ton of resources. These links, again, will be online, and you can wander through them at your leisure. I will tweet this URL, and I will hashtag tag at symbol the conference, so I'm sure they will be happy to retweet it. And that is the entirety of my talk. Thanks. <laughs>